service and welcome to Malware Hell. Today we are going to do a Q&A based on your guys' questions from Twitter posts as well as direct messages. So let's hop right into it. So the first one comes from Theodora Stanos. Before I had Gitar or an IDA license, I would write all my pseudocode by hand for each function. I still like doing that. Am I a masochist? Not for every function though. Absolutely not. It's a good learning experience and keeps you sharp. So why not? Do it once in a while. Let's hop over to the next question. This next question comes from Nat. How did you spend one day without internet? So this was when the Canadian internet just died because of Rogers. Typically these companies will say it's just scheduled maintenance. So, and they didn't release any good information. Cloudflare actually released more information and was more transparent than Rogers was, and they don't even own that network. So that is just sad. <laughs> uh, so true story, I actually had internet that day, which is why I was able to make that tweet. There was some other issues though. I wasn't able to make any debit purchases, so I like, withdrew like 400 in cash because I had to go buy groceries and such. And if I didn't have internet for a day, how would I live without it? Well, I would probably just spend my time reversing a few samples I have. So, no, I'd survive. Let's hop over to the next question. This question comes from DJX and they say, can you reverse an MSF Venom generated EXE? So the answer to that is yes, I can absolutely would love to. Perhaps at some point that is something I will look into doing, record a video about it. So thank you very much for the suggestion. Let's hop over to the next question. This next question comes from Cyber Ronin and I have a screenshot here showcasing some malware when I'm in the debugger changing the domain to example.com so I can get it to beacon out anyway. What's that? Radari? No, it's actually x64 debug by Duncan. For x64 debug on GitHub. Let's hop over to the next question. So this question comes from this guy here. What's the use of pointer corruption? This was in regards to alternative shell code execution, about executing shell code using callback functions. The use of pointer corruption would be when you overwrite something either on the heap or in the stack that is a pointer to a function. If you overwrite that and it's not intended, you can overwrite that pointer to then be called later on as a callback function whenever that function, other function is invoked. It could allow you to execute your own arbitrary code. This would be the purpose of using pointer corruption. Let's hop over to the next question. This question comes from the accidental rebel. Do people on Twitter use a particular hashtag if they're looking for help with malware? They'll use something like the words unknown help when they're posting about it. So that might be something to look for. Let's hop over to the next question. This question comes from AFQAJ. Would Windows Sandbox be considered a public sandbox? The answer to that is it depends. If it's a public sandbox, it exists on the internet where anyone can upload to it really. If they make an account for free and anyone can see it, that would be a public sandbox. A private one would be one that you have hosted on your own that no one else can access. Or if it's a sandbox that you pay for and can do a private submission. Those are the differences. Great question. Let's hop over to the next question. Let's hop on to the next one. So this one comes from Lord RNA. It's a picture of my video editing software in Linux. That's Blender. The answer to that is yes, that is Blender. The video editor in Blender is excellent. I would recommend it to anyone. Let's hop over to the next question. Can you please stop reading my mind? That's exactly what I'm looking for. No, I'm a telepath. Of course I'm going to read your mind. Duh. Let's hop over to the next question. This question comes from Felix. There is really some article saying zero day malware. Where? So a zero day virus, also known as zero day malware or next generation malware, is a previously unknown computer virus. Oh my god. Or other malware for which specific antivirus software signatures are not yet available. So if you can shift one bit or change one byte to something else and you can have it not show up as detected and you just made a zero day. 
watch your YouTube. I'm always looking for videos and blogs made by women if you can steer me in the right direction. So I would recommend that you go to my website, cerberusdedsec.github.io. Go ahead and click on the YouTube link and it'll bring you right to my YouTube channel. So other than that, I would recommend Maddie Stone, Alyssa Knight, Mauer Unicorn. That's a few off the top of my head. Let's hop over to the next question. This question comes from Dave Spencer. Where are the reverse engineering women? To be honest, I don't know. I wish there was more of us. I think the more women that we get into the industry, the more will follow. Let's hop over to the next question. This question is from Barusha. I lost my Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Gmail, Google, Amazon, Netflix, Prime, PayPal, Bank, YouTube, WhatsApp, Telegram, Discord, Twitter, Reddit, Skype, Microsoft, LinkedIn, WeChat, Password. Help, lol. Then why aren't you lost? The answer is I'm just angering the Twitter bots. Let's hop over to the next question. This question comes from John Connor. .net PE traits. Does it do traits based on MSIL? And the answer to that is yes, which is the tool bin next. Let's hop over to the next question. So this question comes from David Ledbeard. One question, what was that crappy math moron said you needed? So it was discrete mathematics. Have you needed it at all? Just the basic truth tables needed no but helpful a little bit yes but for the most part have I used it at all the answer to that is no let's hop over to the next question so this question is from when I did a unpacking workshop for malware okay so do you know if they didn't like your tone and got upset because you're a woman or because their egos got hurt and they can't solve something. So you can't really hop into other people's minds on that day. Perhaps they are having a bad day. It certainly is something that gets annoying. I guess go live as a woman for a day and you would understand. And we'll leave it at that. Let's hop over to the next question. So this one was in regards to Maldroid getting blocked by Jonathan Data. When I get a trophy, it's not hard to get blocked by Jonathan Data. His research is questionable. Look at this excerpt from his paper. This domain, after starting to research the Catalan Gate report at the time the Catalan Gate report was published, the domain had been expired for six months. At Citizen Lab, with the help of MSC International, this other person and this other person published this domain as an active indicator of compromise that is blacklisted around the world. When a domain is associated with a malware, it will try to call out to that usually, even if that domain is expired. So when you do a DNS query for that domain, it ends up being marked as suspicious because even if the domain is expired, even a query to that domain could indicate that a device is potentially infected still. Just because the C2 domain is down does not mean a device is not infected. It is literally that simple. Let's hop over to the next question. This comes from Zorhex. By any chance you have some sort of standard malware report law tech template you like? The answer to that is no and yes, so I don't have one I can give you, so I recommend making your own. Let's hop over to the next question. So this question comes from Provax. Are you familiar with Leap? wanted to get your take and compare it to Binlex. So I use the leaf binary with Binlex to parse portable executables and ELFs and others. Yeah, I would definitely recommend it for parsing binaries. Let's hop over to the next question. Hi, I'm facing the same problem. How did you do this? This was in regards to some strange issues in pseudocode and Ghidra I was having. So the answer to the function was to simply go ahead and add a call fix up fixes up some of the pseudocode when you are dealing with SEH, prologs, epilogs, functions that, you know, are inserted by different compilers and it can really help clean up the pseudocode. Let's hop over to the next question. So this question comes from this guy. I talk to him a lot. <laughs> Any specific reason why LaTeX over Markdown? Markdown for notes is excellent. LaTeX is great for professional reports. Let's hop over to the next question. So the next question is in regards to this post I did. 
I worked for a company that created a shell insurance company to take away health benefits from us and make more money. One employee lost coverage for their cancer treatment. So this was absolutely a true story. A horrible company to work for. I asked to work on their IT team. The guy stated that since there's no way I'd be able to lift a server or a computer. And since then, I left to go work in cybersecurity as a reverse engineer. So they can suck on that. Let's hop over to our next question. So this question comes from Pookie. <laughs> I love the little, uh... all right, we, we got to appreciate this. Oh my God, it's so adorable. Okay, it's Pikachu with pancakes. What is not to love? All right, aside from that, time to add booty to my mute words. <laughs> so here we had someone who was posting a picture of their butt mm. on Twitter. It's just something I didn't really want to see and it was an infosec or security professional. So Pookie states, who cares? It's my Twitter feed. I care because I don't want to look at your mm. butt. If I wanted to go see butts, mm. I would go over to Pornhub. Let's hop over to the next question. So this question comes from Merlin. How did you go about using the font for your Twitter handle? So I use the universal lead converter. So I can put in, I can also convert it to Greek and ta-da, there you go. Let's hop over to the next question. This question comes from Nop. Hey, I finally got around to analyzing Squirrel Waffle. Just a few questions. Looking at PCAP sends requests to C2 every four minutes. Malware will do that. Is so that when they send a request out to the C2, they usually will expect some sort of command or something to be sent back to them from the C2 in response in order to execute whatever they want the malware to do. We typically call this behavior a C2 check-in. Secondly, the client always sends out an ID. These IDs are to ensure that each machine, when it's connected to the C2 server, has a unique identifier, as there can be collisions, of course, with usernames and computer names and other things. So that's why usually they will have a unique ID when they connect. Let's hop over to the next question. This question comes from Roro. How can I thank you for the amazing blog posts you wrote? Don't worry about it. Enjoy them, share them, do what you want. That's it. Let's hop over to the next question. This question comes from Nix. As someone well versed in reversing and malware, would you say a portable Linux machine that you can wipe would be a good malware analysis lab? Well, I would say so. Yes, just to start, it would be a good lab. To get started, absolutely, definitely recommend it, and that's what I did. Let's hop over to the next question. So this next question comes from Megachar. Are you not employed yet? So yes, I'm employed, and looking forward to my first day coming up next week. I'm sure I'm going to work with a whole lot of really awesome people, one of the biggest cybersecurity companies in the world, so I am super excited. So let's hop over to the next question. This question comes from this guy here. Where are you from? So I am from Canada. I'm a Polish Canadian. Are you a malware analysis expert? I am a reverse engineer. There are times that certain malware will, of course, humble me. And I think that's what makes the field exciting. I have made TV appearances as an expert in my country. I suppose they, they would call me an expert, um, but I don't you know, always consider myself an expert. Let's hop over to the next question. This one is from this person here. Lately I've seen your work and really appreciate the content you do. Currently I want to develop myself as a malware analyst. I have a doubt. Do you think I need to have good basics in pen testing? Some basics in pen testing may be helpful. I'd recommend creating a domain of your own, learning about it, playing around with it. You probably don't have to know it as in-depth as a pen tester, but certainly having some general understanding of it would be useful. Let's hop over to the next question. This question comes from uh, Amin. What is the difference between information security and cybersecurity? So information security is the protection of physical documents and papers. 
whereas cybersecurity is a protection of digital assets, files, and such. So they are slightly different. A friend said there is no difference. Well, your friend is wrong. Cyber is more technical than information security, right? The answer to that is more complex. It depends on what you're doing in either industry. Which area do you suggest I focus if I'm to learn cyber? The answer to that is first figure out what you want to do in cyber and then go try those different areas and then we can talk a bit more. Let's hop over to the next question. This one comes from 0x FD 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 FD. I'm looking for the code for a tool called Zeusbot Decryptor. So I don't have that tool. And if you want to get it, hopefully you guys will be able to leave a comment with a link that is working for them in the comments below. Let's hop over to the next question. This comes from Leet. How can I get Ida Probe for free? Well, you could download the cracked version and infect yourself with malware, which you could then use the cracked version to go ahead and analyze. Or alternatively, you can use Ghidra, just like anyone else who wants to use Ida Pro but can't afford it and wants to get into reverse engineering. Let's hop over to the next question. This question comes from Blue Eye. Texting you in case you want me to email you a sample to take a look at from a CTF challenge. I don't really play CTF challenges all that much. Although I have played them in the past, I really don't care for word riddles. So every time they start with a word riddle, it's something I just completely ignore and move on to the next one. I don't enjoy them. Give me a problem, I'll try to solve it. No word games, please. So he also asked about this code here. So get module handle, find resource. This combination looks like it's getting a handle, trying to find a certain resource, getting the size of said resource, and then loading that resource. Are, are you on Discord? The answer to that is yes. You can go check out Binlex official Discord in order to find me. You can also find me in the OA Labs Discord. Let's hop over to the next question. This question comes from this guy here. Is it worth nowadays to learn malware to get a job in global companies? You can certainly go to ninjajobs.org and do a search for reverse engineering, and then it should give you some results. Let's hop over to the next question. Next question comes from T. Parizo. I wonder if you can help with an issue, so something to do with VirtualBox and PFSense doesn't resolve anything. Make sure you have two interfaces, so one for NAT, where PFSense will get its internet from, and another that is isolated, where PFSense is going to have control over the address assignments of the LAN. Let's hop over to the next question. So when they find code, which might or might not look like a library function, of course we have flirt signatures, another way that requires less effort. So instead of fully reversing it. So I'll use a trick where I'll use procmon, for example, and I also will use other monitoring tools like API monitor and such. When I use a debugger, I go to that function, I'll execute over it with those monitoring tools and then see what happens. And that will really narrow it down. Next question, what happens when you find pieces of the sample you're analyzing with similarities with open source? So Bizarre Loader had this thing going on. So what I'll do is I'll compare the legitimate open source versions code to the one that's not legitimate. And instead of focusing on the similarities, I will remove the similarities and focus on the differences. Let's hop over to the next question. This question comes from Neo Malware. Hello, I've been teaching some local college kids about malware, RE, and other areas of security. Awesome! When I started my classes, first few weeks, they were asking about binary exploits, RE, etc. With that said, most recent class is almost malware RE fans, and they had a discussion. What's the future of malware RE? So, first question is, What's the future of malware RE? I can't really answer that definitively, but I would say hopefully we'll be getting more tooling that's open sourced 
Are malware RE skills transferable to other areas in InfoSec? I mean, I would say yes. If you can reverse engineer malware beginning to end, I would say you would definitely be good in an analyst role. So I don't know really what you mean by transferable, but yeah, I think I think some of those skills, of course, would be transferable by other positions. A few students looked on LinkedIn for malware RE roles and didn't find too many. So just go to Ninja Jobs, do a search for reverse engineering, and hopefully you'll be able to see something in there. A lot of them are remote, as you can see. All right, folks, that's all I have for you today. If you do have any questions or comments, leave them below. If you like this video and want to see more like it, please subscribe. As always, stay curious and have a wonderful day. Thank you.